Okay, we got the latest microcode, at least for the MSI motherboards that we're gonna check out regarding Intel CPUs. Uh, this is kind of ahead of schedule, actually. We were expecting middle of August for these microcodes to start dropping. MSI was first, and we tested it. We're gonna talk about what kind of performance you may or may not lose and what sorts of behavioral changes there are with Intel's at least 14900K, which is what we tested on. First, time, time, time to pay the bills. For those looking for a high-end custom gaming experience, look no further than Falcon Northwest. Falcon Northwest has been building PCs made for gamers for over 30 years with a focus on a true high-end gaming experience. Custom cases available only through Falcon Northwest feature state-of-the-art testing and design to ensure that every component is performing at their best through thermal imaging and rigorous lab testing designed and overseen by the Falcon Northwest founder himself. With a complete lineup of systems ranging from small to large, every Falcon Northwest system includes a three-year warranty policy and a year of two-way overnight shipping coverage providing the ultimate peace of mind. To see all that Falcon Northwest has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. All right, so I'm talking about Microcode 0x129. It's actually later or newer than 0x125, which is the code or the microcode that was sort of leaked that Intel was currently testing for the crashing and instability problems regarding your 14th, 13th gen K-SKU CPUs, anything 65 watts and up, which is just about all of them at this point. Um, spoiler alert, we've already talked about this. If your 13th and 14th gen CPU is already experiencing and exhibiting instability behavior, it's done, it's toast. This code is not gonna fix it. That is an Intel problem that they are gonna have to figure out how the hell they're gonna deal with that. But this is for those of you that have had, or have stable CPUs, like mine included at home, has not had any crashing issues, and I've been running it at 320 watt for a long time. This problem does not necessarily plague every single CPU. I mean, the microcode stuff, there's variants in there. So this is for those of you that do not have crashing Intel CPUs and you wanna keep them that way. This is theoretically the way that's supposed to work. Although I think we're all a little leery of whether or not it's really gonna fix the problem and it's not just a Band-Aid. So long-term testing is really gonna show over time if these are gonna fix the problems. So we ran the 14900K on our MSI MPG Z790 Carbon 2 Wi-Fi motherboard, not an ASUS board. So the two BIOS for the Carbon 2 that we used here, one of them goes back to May, which is E7D89IMS.A42, um, which is the first BIOS that MSI launched, with, which specifically put the Intel Extreme and Intel Performance Profiles in the BIOS for you to select. Prior to that, none of those profiles were there at all. They defaulted to the 4,096 watts, the 511 amps, the whole deal, right? The unlimited power, which was what was part of the problem with all of these CPU deaths. So we ran through our CPU test, and then we loaded the latest BIOS, which actually dropped today. This is a very fast video that we're working on this, but today, which is actually a few days later than the previous BIOS, which dropped with the 0x125, which is the first revision microcode fix from Intel. So MSI has been rolling these out actually pretty quickly. So this BIOS, the second BIOS was the E7D89IMS.A51. So on their website as of 88. 2024. Now that could change. There could still be some revisions to that microcode, but we wanted to see what kind of performance hit, increase, changes, behavior, whatever that's going to happen by changing uh, the microcode. Now the microcode and the ME engine also had a separate installer that we had to run. So it wasn't just the BIOS update. You need to look at the package uh, from your BIOS manufacturer or your motherboard manufacturer and see what they're patching notes are because if you were to just install the BIOS but not run the ME engine or the ME installer, you would not have gotten the microcode on your CPU either. So you have to run those together. Asus motherboards tends to do it all together as a package. It'll do a restart and then do the ME automatically. So depending on your motherboard, you may or may not have to do that. So check with your motherboard's installation instructions. Let's go ahead and get right into the results here because this is where things get Kind of interesting because you'll notice if we look on the chart here, and I left all our CPUs on there. We'll start with um, we'll start with Cinebench R23 All Core. So you see at the bottom of the chart it says 14,900K 0x29. That's the latest BIOS, and the 0x23. That's what the microcode was for the BIOS that came out with the Performance and Extreme profiles. It's also important to note this is on the Extreme 253 watt profile, which is actually what Intel says the performance is supposed to be. But as you can see, no significant change visible uh, to the 14900K in that test. If you take a look at Cinebench R23, the single thread score, um, again, a slight uplift, 2336 on single core to a 2345 single core. Again, margin of error. You can run this, 10, 10, this, run this test 10 times and get 10 different results there. If we look at R24, which is an, actually a harder 
test to run than R23. It does, it's different types of instructions that are actually happening during the test. It's not just one that's hammering the cores. Uh, we went from a 2136 down to a 2124. I would actually say in the multi-threading test in R24, this is actually more of a significant measurable drop. Um, a 2136 to a 2124 is noticeable. You'll notice these are much lower score numbers than like R23. So a 22 point or a 12 point drop is actually somewhat noticeable um, in terms of the test. Now, if we go to a single core run on R24, it's exactly the same, 136 to 136. You'll notice kind of a theme here. The single core stuff doesn't really seem to be affected too much, although single core workloads is where a lot of the voltage would jump too high, as high as 1.6 on the old microcode, um, where you actually would see the voltage problem more than just all core. If you enable an all core workload, most of the cores due to VDroop will actually drop their vid drop their vid out of the danger zone. But it's actually the single core workloads that have a, a chance to burst the voltage high enough to potentially cause damage. Um, at least I had a whole discussion with Falcon Northwest about that, which was actually quite surprising. I always just assumed the all core workload would be the biggest stress to the CPU, but no. If we're talking about voltage sensitivity, it's actually single and two core workloads that can cause that burst. And we'll look at the chart later where you'll actually see some of that on the pre um, 0x129. All right, so looking at Geekbench here, a little bit of a drop. So from 20,169 to a 20,033. It's important to note this is all the exact same system for, for this these tests. This is not like we threw it on a different rig and saw how it performed. This is only the BIOS and management engine change for the microcode. Now Geekbench uh, single core, you can see we go from a 3209 to a 3197. Um, fairly margin of error there. Not the significant performance hit, at least that we've seen so far, that a lot of people were expecting potentially happen. I think what people were thinking was gonna happen is that there was gonna maybe be, with the new microcode, a voltage slash frequency drop across the board on these on the cores, and so far that's not what we're seeing here. I don't think, I don't think we have, most of us ever expected that to be the case, but I know that that's what people have been sort of like throwing out into the, into the void sphere for people to either just, I don't know, believe or whatnot. But if we look at Handbrake, you can see we gained one second of render time. So Handbrake is a lower is better type of score. It's how many seconds it took to transcode our 4K video down to 1080p. Um, we're not using quick sync or any of that stuff. This is just raw CPU power. And you can see we went from a 59 seconds to a 60 seconds. Again, complete margin of error. That could be a rounding error with the way that it does a fraction of a second. It could have been more than 59.5, which at that point would just round up to 60 seconds. Now we actually picked up some performance in Blender. So you can see we went from in the classroom render, um, which is a ray trace rendering, we went from 110.55 to a 111.27, a little bit larger than the margin of error. We've seen, now these are samples, samples higher is better. Um, we tend to see that we could run this test 10 times and get very, very, very similar results every single time, not this like two or three point variant. So there was a little bit of a pickup there. If we take a look at uh, Junk Shop, however, we lost a little bit of performance there, 158.09 to 156.28. Again, potentially margin of error, but it's still noticeable and, and we have to mention that. Now Monster is nearly identical at 229.28 versus 229.55. So nearly identical performance there. Now Time Spy was an interesting one because all these tests are different type of instruction that we're asking the CPU to do. And different types of instructions will hit the cores and hit the logic with the way the voltage and the frequencies operate in a different way. So Time Spy Extreme went from an 11,941 down to an 11,264. 700 points in the CPU test is a significant drop that's actually noticeable. Sometimes we have to overclock our CPUs to pick up 700 points in CPU tests in Time Spy Extreme when we're doing like the XOC stuff. So seeing it drop 700 points is actually a, a pretty significant talking point right here. That, that so far is the biggest change we've seen with the new microcode versus the existing microcode. Now, if we go into gaming, however, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, pretty much identical. The reason for that is the fact that the 14900K and an RTX 4090 can hit the engine cap of 300, mega, uh, 300 frames per second in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So it's 1080p medium, no scaling, no RTX, higher is better. We're trying to push as many frames to the CPU as possible so that we can see how the CPU handles that. So you can see 301 and 300. 300 is a new cap. That game used to be capped at around 220. Over the years, they've actually increased that cap. Now it's around 300. So you can see we're hitting the cap before we're hitting or seeing any sort of degradation in performance by having this new microcode. Cyberpunk 2077, however, is a CPU intensive title. And we did see a drop 
although you have a hard time noticing it, we did see a drop. 236 average FPS down to 229. And our minimum FPS also dropped from a 190 to a 186. Now, like I said, it's, now like I said, Cyberpunk is a more intensive CPU type of title. It's got a lot of AI happening in the game. It's got a huge city that's got a lot of NPCs doing things and the CPU is in charge of handling a lot of the way that those uh, simulations interact in the game. And then obviously the GPU is, in, is responsible for all of the like post-processing of the scenes to make them beautiful and obviously accelerate the scenes. So an uh, actual measurable drop in Cyberpunk um, 2077. In fact, it dropped it almost down to the 14600K's number. Now, obviously we have to retest all of our 14th gen and 13th gen CPUs prior to the next round of CPU testing because all of these CPUs may see the same potential type of drop. Most of the problems that we've been experiencing has specifically been on the 900 or the i9 SKUs, so 13900 and 14900. Some 13700 and 14700s have seen instability issues. Very few of the 14600 or 13600 CPUs have seen this type of issue. It really comes down to the higher, more dense core count CPUs that are having this problem. Now seeing FPS charts and stuff like that, that's only part of the story. The other thing we did was I did a 10 minute Cinebench run R23 all core um, to just sort of see if there's any visual differences that happen over time. So I charted out over time a few different things. So for instance, we'll start with the core clocks here. Um, what I'm looking for here is to see if there's any core clock drop. Was there any drop between pre-129 or post-129. And as you can see by looking at this chart, the green and the blue are the P cores, the orange and the yellow are the E cores. You can see we're still getting about 5.1, 5.15 megahertz uh, or gigahertz on all the P cores before and after, and all of the trends are the same. All these low spikes that you see, by the way, this is when the test restarts. So the frequency actually drops during the test restart. Um, and then obviously under load, they jump back up because we do have C-states enabled in the CPU. That's part of the profile stuff to make sure C-states are enabled. Um, believe it or not, a lot of the motherboards actually were disabling C-states, so they would just run full speed constantly all the time. So that's why you see these sudden drops in the chart. Now, if you look at the start though, on the E-Core Pre-0X129, which is the yellow line, you can see at the start, it's 50 to 100 megahertz higher for the first three and a half runs. And then it basically matches where we are post 0x129. So I thought that that was interesting that we see no difference on the P core, but we see a little behavioral difference on the E core. Now, if we move over here to package temperatures, they were pretty much identical. Now, what I was hoping to see here was that we'd see some um, temperature drop because if we were seeing potential voltage dropping, then that would lead to lower temperatures. But as you can see here with our, um, my Cooler Master 280 uh, millimeter AIO on here, we pretty much have identical temperatures across the board. So the green line, as you can see here, this is package temp pre microcode. The blue line is post microcode, and it's pretty much identical. Now, if we take a look at the voltage, on the other hand, um, this is where things are a little bit interesting because if you take a look at the green line, which is the pre 129 patch or microcode patch, you can see the voltage spikes. So you saw on the frequency test, in between the tests, the frequency drops. However, there's going to be one or two cores, and remember there's 28 threads in a 14900K. One or two cores is gonna to spike to load the test. That's just because of the fact that it becomes a like very low thread workload to load the test or get it started. So this is when we're gonna see these voltage spikes. Now look at the spikes, right? Especially the ones right here in the middle. They get awfully close to 1.6 volts while starting the test. And then you can see during the test, they shoot down. And then as the load comes off and it reloads the test, that single core voltage spike spikes again real high. And it's not that high at the start. It's what's interesting about that is it's not that high at the start of the test. It starts to go higher in the middle of the test. Now, if we take a look at the blue line, which is post microcode update, you can see we still have those similar spikes in the same spots, but they're not as high. They're not exceeding 1.51 volts was the highest that I observed. Whereas we were getting 1.58 volts prior to it. So this is where we're actually seeing the microcode changes is gonna be in single core um, and maybe low core count type of workloads where those CPUs are staying at a much higher core clock closer to the six gigahertz, which is what you're supposed to get on single and two core performance on the 900 SKUs. To get six gigahertz, you need voltage to support that. So as you can see right here, it definitely drops the voltage a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit 
after the microcode update. So this is where we saw the biggest change was this, the, the low core count voltage spikes. Now, if we take a look at package power, this is also where it's a little bit interesting too. The green line, as you can see, it's steady at 253. And when I say steady, I mean it, there's a little bit of a wave in there, but it is like, you can tell 253 is the cap. However, the blue line, as you can see, has a more kind of a wavy fluctuating pattern underneath 253. So it actually dropped down to about 245 to like 248 average with spikes hitting 253. So that's probably linked obviously to voltage. Voltage is directly correlated to watts, obviously. Voltage, watts, and amps. All three of those are related. That's how electricity works. So it makes sense that with that little bit of voltage change that we were seeing, at least with the low core count voltages, that there would be a different way that it hits the headroom or the, the target, I should say. So it hits that target a little more smoothly rather than just throwing itself against that 253 watt limit and then just locking itself there. So this is the way it looks post microcode. Now, as I said already, whether or not you trust Intel's microcode to really be the fix, it's probably the best idea to wait and see how this goes over time. Like I said, MSI was the first brand to come out right now with the microcode. I got a million emails this morning when I woke up saying, hey, the new microcode's out, why don't you test it? Here it is. At the end of the day, it is not, and I know this sounds like Intel fanboying right now, it's not. I'm team computer, I love computers. I don't care if it's Intel or AMD or an Nvidia. I just, I just love computers, whatever it is that works for you. But. It's not the, oh my God, your CPUs are about to get nerfed type of performance hit. At most, we saw about 2% of average performance hit. No one's gonna notice 2%. If I have to give up 2% or even 5% of performance to have it be stable, yeah, I'll be upset about that because that would mean I lost some performance that I paid for and was advertised to get, but I'd much rather have my CPU be stable. We took bigger hits with Spectre and Meltdown with those updates, which were security updates than we're seeing with this. But again, I don't think the story's over yet. I, 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 because of the fact that MSI released a 0x125 and then only a few days later a 0x129, I'm wondering if there's like a 0x131 or something Intel is working on. Now we need to see over time if this fixes the problem. Like I said, if you have a CPU that's not crashing, you're probably safe, but that doesn't mean it hasn't already degraded somewhat that, you, that isn't noticeable because your workloads don't hit it in a way that it would present itself. That's the trust issue that everyone's having right now with Intel. And unfortunately, as I said, if you're already getting blue screens and stuff and it's related to this, your CPU is already toast. It's time to RMA that, however painful that process is gonna be. All right, guys, there you go. Tell me how you feel about the new microcode. Hopefully this fixes stuff, but we definitely aren't gonna know right now. It's gonna take time. Thanks for watching. As always, we'll see you in the next one.